Thank you, Michaela. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, again, my name is Nelson Estrella, Product Manager for Damper Actuators. And today uh, on this webinar, we'll be covering basic tips and tricks when troubleshooting damper actuator installation. Now, in this webinar, we're going to go over some very common issues that we've come across the uh, across the, during uh, looking at installations and assisting customers throughout the years. Um, and for the most part, like I said, these will just cover very commonplace issues covering mechanical, electrical, and some minor installation issues that you may come across. But if this webinar doesn't answer all your questions or assist you in troubleshooting, I highly recommend you contact our tech support staff who is willing and able to always help you in any and then all problems that you may have in determining the solution to your issue, try and get the installation up and running. Now, going through a troubleshooting checklist, we want to cover three aspects, just like I mentioned before, mechanical, electrical, and installation. Starting with the mechanical, first thing you want to check is the damper. Um, most cases we have heard back from customers saying that something's wrong with the actuator. When in fact, the damper itself may have some issues. So prior to installing a new damper actuator or maybe replace an existing damper actuator, verify that your damper is operating properly. Especially if it's rotating freely, that's an important indicator that your damper is working fine. Uh, one recommendation that we do ask or we do tell our customers is to see if you can manually operate the damper open and close. In some cases, some dampers may be linked together, and come, uh, making a larger bank of dampers connected through a jack shaft or different linkages. It may not be possible to be operated by hand, but as long as you can inspect all the different linkages and working parts of the damper, just to ensure that everything is in working order, then everything should be okay when you install the damper actuator. Speaking of linkages, you also want to double check if, if a jack shaft linkage is present. Jack shaft is just a round rod or it could be hollow shaft, in front of the damper or dampers, and mechanically linked to either the side of the damper frame or directly to a damper blades to open and close. I want to make sure that, that the um, jack shaft is in uh, good working order and check the bearings from, ends, from the ends and also in the middle, depending on how long the jack shaft may be, to ensure that the jack shaft is retaining properly. And also, you also want to double check is if, the, depending on where the actuator is mounted, that the torque is evenly distributed throughout that jack shaft. And we'll go over to some other slides to show you different mounting methods on a jack shaft. Also, when you mount the damper actuator, as you know, Bolimo actuators are designed for direct coupling onto a damper to ensure that the anti rotation strap is properly fastened and installed. Now, looking at the image here on the slide, the actuator is directly coupled to the damper by means of its hollow axle and clamp. At the bottom end, where cables come out is where the slot is used to install this anti-rotation strap. The anti-rotation strap is held by two screws and it prevents the actuator from rotating while it's in operation. Now what you want to do here is one tip that we always give our, our customers is to install this damper, I'm sorry, the anti-rotation bracket not all the way up into the slot, maybe halfway up to the slot to allow the actuator to move just a little bit. Why we say that is because if the actuator doesn't have just a little bit of wiggle room, so when it reaches its end stops, the actuators may mind up a little bit, and if it doesn't reach its full rotation, let's say 90 or 95 degrees, and maybe the damper is only rotating 80 degrees, it's going to hit that mechanical end stop and just drive a little bit further, and the actuator is going to want to deliver that torque somewhere. So you're going to have a little bit of a torsional torque delivered by the actuator, and it's going to want to bend somewhere before it gets into overload um, protection. So allowing the anti-rotation strap to be just slightly into that slot at the bottom of the actuator, allowing the actuator to flex just a little bit and to prevent any other damage to the clamp or maybe even to the linkage. Now furthermore on the damper, you want to also take, the, take a look at the condition of the damper. Operating the damper blades and checking all the bearings and linkages is very important. You also want to take the take into account the structural, the looks, or the appearance of the damper is very important. In some cases, if you look at an existing installation, maybe a building's been around for many, many years, dampers may undergo some wear and tear. Sometimes you'll find some damper frames are either twisted, bowed, sagging, or bent. Now, for visible signs, in terms of what the damper may look like, 
Uh, one, one case that we see mostly is when it's bowed a little bit. Maybe the opening of where the damper is installed is not quite in the right dimensions. So I mean, height-wise, it's just a little tight, a few inches, uh, a little tight on the, on the vertical side. So when the damper was installed, it's a little pressed, and you can see the sides of the, act of the damper being bowed a little bit. The problem there is when the damper is not perfectly square, uh, the bearings and all the different parts and linkages may be undergoing some additional stress and causing additional friction, which in, in turn increases the torque to operate it. Uh, you can see bowed uh, dampers and even twisted dampers when it's not properly squared and installed into the wall or the opening where it's supposed to be. So maybe parts of it is leading out or inside, leaning outside or inside of the uh, installation, thus causing the same problem when the bearings aren't properly aligned. Also, you see some racked um, dampers which are not properly squared. You'll see them off just a little bit to the side. Also, another indication that probably the opening is not properly sized for that damper. Now when you go into sections, so basically you have more than one damper, you may have dampers that are either going across in a row, that probably there's not, pro there's not proper structural support underneath the dampers, causing some certain sections to sag. The problem there is if they're mechanically linked, again, you're going to have some issues with the linkages and probably a jack shaft that are linking all three of these dampers not to operate properly. Again, increasing the friction and thus increasing the torque to operate. Uh, again, on the left side, too, uh, lack of structural support, either vertical or horizontal, could cause the dampers to, over time to just kind of wheel out of their, their spot and cause more issues. So operation is very key, and also the installation of these dampers uh, is goes hand in hand. So I just want to double check the support and how well installed these dampers are. Another issue that we've come across when dampers have been installed for many, many, for a long, very long time, or maybe the building has not been commissioned yet. So the damper's just been installed and they're still doing work around the, the, the system, right, around the dampers, installing more electrical wiring, what, what have you. And uh, they, what we've seen, and I've personally seen this at job sites, where they actually use the dampers as ladders. They may step on the damper blades or even on the jack shaft, and you'll see it's visible where and you'll see that the dampers or the jack shafts are sagging in the middle. Again, this causes damage, which in turn will probably cause the damper not to operate properly or even increase the torque, and the actuaries may be rendered useless since it cannot open and close that damper. So you want to keep an eye out for those kind of things. Again, besides the damper itself is how the actuary is being mounted. So those two things go hand-in-hand hand to make sure that the, as a system they work together properly. Now, depending if the actuary is mounted within the airstream, like say in front of the damper on its side, to make sure it's properly installed on either onto the drive shaft on the side of the damper or on the jack shaft that's shown in, in the photo here. Nice here is this damper bank uh, for this data center that we see here. Every damper has its own actuator, which is a very good idea. So if any of these actuators fail, the other dampers may still operate, and all I have to do is replace that one actuator's bed to get that damper up and running again. So depending on where it's installed and how it's being used is very important. We get, you can get into environmentals in the next few slides uh, in the presentation. But the one thing I always wanted to point here is ambient temperature. Now, depending on where it's installed, it could be outside or indoors, but depending on if you're using the proper accessories and using the proper protection for actuators, temperature is very important. Depending on where, you're, where it is installed and what your application is, make sure you verify what the ambient temperatures could be. Uh, depending on higher exposures, cold or hot, the actuaries will run its life cycle a lot sooner than later, and the actuaries may fail prematurely. So always want to double check what your application ambient temperatures are versus the specified temperature range of the actuators. Now going back to the mechanical, uh, the I'm um, sorry, the installation of the actuators. Here's a typical installation where you see a jack shaft being used on a damper. And I'd say in the image on the left, there's a single damper and requires a little higher more uh, in terms of torque loading, one actuator is not enough. Here you can piggyback or tandem mount two actuators to deliver enough torque to operate that control damper properly. Now in this case, since the jack shaft isn't that long, you can mount two of these damper actuators on one end. Now this shouldn't be an issue, especially if the jack shaft isn't that long and we have the accessories to, double, to dual mount these actuators. So on the image on the right, 
is a different case where the jack shaft is actually longer and you have two dampers side by side. Now in this case, since you need to have just the amount, same amount of torque and maybe the airflow is just about right and after you do your torque loading calculation, you determine that two actuators are needed to operate these two control dampers. Now when it comes to this case, and since the jack shaft is a bit longer, we highly recommend to install one actuator on one end and the other on the other, on the other end. This will uh, evenly distribute the torque throughout the jack shaft and operate the dampers properly. Now we recommend this is because if we've seen issues in the field, we have both actuators on one end, similar to, one, to the image on the left, but when you have a configuration like the one on the right, the issue there is, in terms of physics, you only have all that torque delivered on one end if you have both actuators on one end, and at the end of, end of the jack shaft where the actuators are not mounted on, you're not getting full torque. So you'll see one damper, on, say, on the right, being going full open and full close, while the other one on the left may not go all the way open and may not go all the way closed. So there may be issues in your system. So we always highly recommend that you evenly distribute the torque by installing actuators on both ends. Of course, wiring is very important. We've had issues in the past where customers can't figure out why these actuators aren't working together. So we'll cover in the next few slides in terms of wiring, how, how to connect these actuators to make sure they work together. Another scenario we've seen in terms of configuration and installing a damper actuator is using one actuator to drive two dampers. In this case, after you do, of course, your proper uh, torque calculations to verify that one actuator can drive two dampers, is to determine the installation and using the proper accessories. So in this case, a face and bypass installation, very typical out there in an air handler or RTU, you can use a one direct couple actuator to drive one uh, damper, say in this case the bottom one, and use linkages, crank arms, ball joints, and a push rod to drive the other one. So in this case, you drive one damper open and while the other one closes. Now in some cases, you may have this as an existing installation and just want to replace the actuator. When you come across this, you always want to double check that linkages are working properly. You've heard in the past that we've had issues that when they install a brand new actuator, it's just not working anymore. Well, probably just because the linkages are just not up to date. Maybe it's just the issues that there's corrosion, uh, there's a lot of dirt or buildup around the linkages which doesn't allow it to rotate freely. Could have been the issue, it could have been the reason why that original actuator failed. But prior to installing a new replacement actuator, just double check that these linkages are in working order. Now, Belima does offer a range of different accessories for replacement. So if you see a lot of these crank arms slipping, uh, you probably see some wear marks in the shafts, you probably want to re replace those crank arms put before putting this new actuator in place. Always I'll double check the ball joints and the pressure rods to make sure they're, in, they're properly fastened and they're not falling, they're not falling loose because if you don't double check that, maybe the travel is not being fully achieved and that's be another ca cause of problems like having one damper opening and the other one not going full close in most cases. So always want to double check your linkages prior to installing a new actuator. Uh, one finalization that we've come across is the older school uh, foot mounted type actuators where you don't have a direct couple method so there's no jack shaft and there's no linkage to attach to the damper frame. In this case, you'd have to use a foot mount or crank arm kit to mount whatever actuators on to drive uh, damper open and close. Now in this case, this is more of a classical type approach, but you also have a little bit more variables to take into account. Now if the existing linkage is already there, like say a push rod, a ball joint, and a damper clip shown here on a damper blade to drive it open and close, you want to double check the location of where the, uh, the actuator is going to be mounted and to minimize the effects of variations within the linkages. This is a little bit more complicated versus a, a direct mounted actuator, but it's not as complicated if you try to, try to maintain the existing layout that's already there. So we highly advise to keep the same location and try, if possible, to reduce the length of those push rods if, 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 it's, in, if it's possible at all. Um, the longer the push rod is, the more travel it's going to take, and you may have some issues in delivering full torque from the actuator pushing onto the damper. So in this case, uh, you want to double check the installation, the location, and also the linkages connecting to the damper. In some cases, the damper clip may have to be replaced, maybe a little bit closer to the left or to the ends of the damper. In this case, it's on to the left there. 
outside of the further way away from the airstream is ideal to make sure the actuator is not being exposed to any other environmental conditions. In some cases, some of these older installations, these damper actuators may be dry, opening and closing an outside air damper. So you may have not, may not have proper filtering or screens on the other side of that damper, and so you have some moisture coming in and over time causing corrosion and damage to the actuator. So you want to double check that type of installation as well. And to finish, also in terms of mechanical, you want to look at the electrical connections. In this case, you see it, the both cables have the conduit fittings and conduit, uh, uh, and conduit, sorry, protecting the cables to ensure that the cables will get damaged or nicked and may cause a disconnect to the actuator and render it useless. So proper uh, electrical protection and installation per local codes is highly recommended and to also uh, to uh, further the life of the actuator. Now moving from mechanical electrical, uh, basic troubleshooting tips here is just to check your uh, actuator voltage. Uh, we've come across issues where we've had customers using 24 volt models when line voltage is present. Issue there is when applying line voltage to a 24 volt or low voltage type model, you're gonna blow out the internal circuitry and the actuator will be rendered useless. So always be careful to verify what voltage is available, what's going to be used, and the actuators match up accordingly. So if you have a 24 volt model, you might want to make sure you have a step down transformer to supply the correct voltage to the actuator to prevent any damage. So that's very uh, um, a very uh, straightforward checkup uh, to make sure that the power is being supplied. And also the next bit would be the control signal. Now, so if it's an on-off type actuator, all you need is voltage. Two wire supply, power up to open, take away the power to close. For fail safe type actuators, the spring does all the work when you remove the power, so the springs close. When it comes to modulating uh, type actuators, could be a fail safe or not fail safe, you always want to verify the control signal is getting to the actuator as it's supposed to. Now, one way to verify the control signal is using a digital multimeter. We want to verify the control signal going to the actuator for using our common wire number one as your as your reference, so it'll be your negative lead, and using the positive lead of your multimeter to wire three. Now depending on what control signal you're using, so for example, is a two to ten volt signal, you want to verify you get your full two to ten range delivered to the actuator. Now if there's some issues there and your signal is not coming through as a two to ten signal, you want to verify your wiring and make sure your control output is has enough dry output current delivering that voltage. Now the issue is if, say, the voltage is correct and also the control signal is getting to the actuator, maybe you want to double check that sizing. Maybe the actuator is not delivering enough torque and the actuator is undersized. So that could be another thing to look back and backtrack to see if the actuator, the actuator selection is the right one. Now in terms of control signal, like I said before, double, double check if the control has enough signal to get to the actuator. Also, if it seems like the actuator is not moving and it's still connected to the damper, one suggestion we do is to remove or just disconnect the uh, damper actuator from the damper and verify the actuator by itself. Now, the actuator is just going to move when it's told to, so if the actuator does respond to a control signal or just being applied to voltage if it's on off, then the actuator seems to be working fine. So when it's placed back onto the damper and you still have an issue, then it could be something wrong with the installation. You always want to double check the rotation of the actuator. So maybe where it's sitting where it's sitting at its start position is actually closed and you want the damper to go open, maybe it's backwards. So you may have to change the damper position to the damper blade to the match the travel of the actuator, or if it's a modulating actuator, you can change the direction of rotation switch to match the rotation that you desire for your damper. Also, you want to check in terms of control signals and also response from the actuator is to verify your impedances and current requirements. Now, for example, for SRs and MFT versions, for DC controls, we specify 100 kilo ohm input impedance and a 0.1 milliamp uh, uh, source current. So you need 0.1 milliamps to drive our actuators with a 2 to 10 volt signal. Now that's one thing you want to go backtrack and check your controller has enough output to drive one or more actuators. So it could be another issue is there some limitations that your controller can handle. Uh, impedances for, no, for, the, for, the, for the general parts, it's just standard. 
It's always a high impedance for these type of signals, so it should be an issue there. But also, you got to, but for the moment, for the main part, you always want to double check the output current and your output levels of your controller going into these modulating type actuators. Now, going into wiring, uh, for parallel wiring of actuators when they're not on the same shaft. So basically, for like that example I showed you before, every damper had its own actuator installed onto it. Uh, it's just very straightforward. For on-off actuators, you only have two wires. For say, um, for spring return on-off actuators, you just power wires one and two. Uh, one being your common wire and two being your power, 24 volts or your line voltage. Uh, apply power, it drives open. You remove power, it springs closed. Now when it comes to modulating, uh, we recommend you parallel wire as shown here. So basically you have a single control output feeding into the different inputs of the different actuators. Now the actuators are now going to be using the same signal to drive open together, even though they're not talking to each other, but they'll be using the same signal to open and close. Now the important thing here is, and we've seen issues in the past, is the reference. So you've got to make sure that the control signal's negative leg is connected to the common of our actuators. This serves as an internal reference to make sure it's interpreted properly when the control signal is supplied to the actuator. So if that connection is not there, a 5-volt signal may not be seen as a 5-volt signal to the actuator. So you may see the actuator um, respond erroneously and not go to its proper position. So you always want to double check your connections from your control signal output to the common leg of our actuators. So this can be done at the controller itself. If not, you can do it at the actuator's end. Uh, to ensure proper operation. Now we do have some cases where it say you have separate dampers with its own actuators and they all want to work at the same time and monitor a single feedback. Um, we don't have any issues with that but we don't highly recommend daisy chaining, that's what we call it when you take the output of the one actuator from the previous actuator and feed that into the next actuator and, go, and so on and so forth. Essentially the problem there is when you daisy chain actuators like this, the problem is when you have one actuator fail the actuators following that actuator will stop responding. So if you have a damper bank, say in that other image I showed you for the data center, say if they were all daisy chained and one, say that even the first actuator would fail, then all the other dampers will not open. That's a big problem. So we highly recommend using a, um, uh, a parallel wiring approach as shown here. So the actuators do work together but independently when opening and closing dampers. And that way if one fails, the other ones keep working. Like piggyback or master-slave wiring, here you would use this just to, for uh, higher torque applications. Similar to that one I was showing you with a two dual actuators installed on one end or on opposite ends of the shaft, that's when two actuators have to work together to drive a common load. Now in this case, so for instance, uh, we're showing a proportional or modulating control type actuator, MFT kind. Uh, the MFTs have a built-in algorithm that allows the first actuator to talk to the following actuators and work together. That's what the master-slave uh, terminology comes in place. So the first actuator here on the left acts as the master and takes the feedback of that master and feeds it into the input of the slaves or the, or the slave, depending on what how many actuators or actuators uh, series you plan on using. The master will tell the slaves when to move, when they're connected together, and to drive and deliver the full torque to that load. Now this is only used for MFT type actuators. If you use our SRs, your standard 2 to 10 actuators, you can't do this for piggyback, but if say if you use uh, like previous on the parallel wiring and if you want to use daisy chain, you can use SR actuators. Uh, they're only 2 to 10, you can't change the control signal, uh, but they will work perfectly fine. With MFT actuators, you cannot daisy chain because of the piggyback algorithm. So you can only use this for uh, higher uh, higher torque loads. We need one more, more than one actuator. But again, we've seen issues when the negative light of the control signal is not connected to the common when the actuators don't respond properly. So always double double check that wiring, and always double check if the master slave is being used when it's on the same shaft or on the same load. When they're not wired like this, you're going to have some issues, and the actuators are not talking to each other, and hence over time the there's a tolerance between every single actuator that may build up and an error will build up and the actuators will not start working in unison and it may start fighting against each other. So we've seen this in the past when the actuators are not wired properly as master-slave that the actuators end up fighting each other because they're not starting up at the exact same time. 
So I always want to double check your wiring and you know consult Belimo if you need it, if you have any more questions. Now installation, when you've kind of worked out all your mechanical and electrical issues and make sure everything is working all right, where or how this actuator is being installed is very important. Now remember I mentioned ambient environmentals. Well, mounting outdoors is very, very um, uh, particular when it comes to actuators. You've got to be very careful on how you mount it and what you use to protect the actuators. Uh, sand volume actuators are NEMA 2 rated, which means for indoor use only for typical HVC applications. So when you use it outdoors, you want to make sure that the actuator is rated for outdoor use. We do have standalone actuators or NEMA 4 rated. We also have options or accessories that allow you to mount actuators outdoors. Uh, shown here is our ZS300, which are our NEMA 4X housing, which is mainly uh, designed for corrosive environments, but we do have weather shields that will, ha will uh, provide a degree of protection to our actuators. Let's we'll say in this case, ZS300, probably used for mostly for uh, high, high content of chlorine or all of all of different types of corrosive environments they may run into. So this stainless steel housing will protect our actuators for any of those type of uh, environmentals. Now we also have an explosive type of uh, protection, which is a ZS260, which is not shown here. It's a die-cast aluminum housing that allows to, to protect the actuator and use in types of environments. And it works in both ways. It works in two ways. Uh, one, it prevents the actuator from being a source of ignition for an explosion, and also protects the actuator from an explosion, uh, and helps it to continue doing its job to open and close a damper. So it's a ZS, the ZS260 is a lot bigger, a lot heavier, but depending on the application, we have most housings to address your needs. Now, wrap things up. Uh, most cases, same things may be obvious when you're looking at some installations, uh, probably existing installations for the most part. Take this photo here. We're looking at an existing installation for a fire and smoke uh, damper. I believe this was taken in New York City. We're Rather old, the damper is uh, really worn and torn, but barely used. Uh, it looks like the actuator on the right failed, and the one on the left is still working. Uh, but unfortunately, the billing manager decided to say, well, I guess I'll just pry this open to keep the air going with a 2 by 4 Very big no-no, because if these two dampers are doing the same function, then you're defeating the purpose of having the one on the left still working, because you've got the one on the right pried open. The issue here is, well, if the damper is busted, you should replace it, especially on a fire and smoke type of application. So when you come across this type of installation and you remove that 2 by 4 you want to double check if those linkages and everything else is in working order. Maybe it's been open like this for so long, maybe a lot of parts have been corroded or just basically just kind of got stuck in place. So the worst case scenario here is that you may have to replace the whole damper or most of the linkage that makes up this damper. So that's something that really stands out. And another one that stands out is, well, like I mentioned before, where is this thing being installed? Is it indoors or outdoors? Well, a testament to our Swiss engineering, these actuators are pretty rugged, but uh, what's wrong with this picture? Well, as pretty as those clouds are, these actuators should not be out taking any sun, unless it's in a NEMA or housing. So if you look at this actuator by itself, this is actually a greenhouse application. Well, the customer said, well, your actuators are pretty good, I'll just put them outside. Well, not a good idea. Even though they use uh, waterproof conduit for the cables, the actuators are exposed to environments and they failed within a few months. Uh, they actually had uh, several actuators installed in this, install in this site and these actuators all started failing around the same time. But the problem was easily solved when we showed the, uh, with the customers that they, 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 they used the proper housing and they got the NEMA 4 models or NEMA 4 versions of these models, replaced these actuators, now they're working trouble free. So things like this are very stand out pretty well. I mean, if the rating's not there, it's not meant to be used outdoors. So it's all things to keep out, keep on the lookout for. And that's pretty much it. I hope this webinar was very helpful. Again, if we didn't cover most of the things that you might have run into, like I said, these are very common or, or basic things that we've run into over the years, please contact our tech support staff. We're willing and able to help you to find a solution to your problem. Thank you so much, Nelson. And now we will open the floor for questions. So our question and answer session works like this. On the right-hand side of your screen, you will see a question box. That is where you will type in your question. We will read it aloud, and Nelson will answer it as best as possible. 
while some of you are typing in those questions, please be advised that all of our webinars are recorded. So if you're joining us later, you had to step away during at during any time, you can surely review the webinar um, when it's posted on YouTube or sent out in a later email. All right, first question, are you ready? Yes. What tips can Belimo provide on fastening the actuator's clamp onto a stainless steel damper shaft? Oh, that's a very good question. Um, stainless steel is not unheard of. Depending on the application, you may come across an entire damper being built out of stainless steel blades, frame, and the dry shaft. It could be a linkage that could be coupled onto the frame or a jack shaft itself. Uh, the first two things that uh, come to mind is to make sure the damper or damper actuator clamp is properly centered onto the, that jack shaft or the drive shaft of the damper. Uh, in this case, check the diameter. It could be half inch, three quarter inch, or one inch. Uh, most of our actuators have built-in inserts into the clamp. So you want to make sure you use the right insert onto the clamp. Uh, we have, like I said, a half inch or a three-quarter inch, or if we remove any of those smaller inserts, it will center on a one-inch shaft. This will ensure that the clamp is properly centered on that jack or the shaft to drive the actuator. I'm sorry, to drive the damper. And the other tip that we give customers is to probably score the damper shaft, especially if it's a half-inch diameter. Uh, the surface area is reduced, so there's not much down, much to bite down onto. So if you score up the surface of that uh, damper shaft, that'll allow our clamp to bite down a lot better and to prevent slippage. So make sure it's centered and probably score up that damper shaft to make sure that the clamp bites down on it. Okay. Next question. I have 20 2 to 10 VDC actuators tied to a single controller output. Sometimes they respond to control and sometimes they don't. What could be the problem? Okay, let me go back to this guy right here. Oh, sorry, that guy. Now, say if you've got these 20 actuators, I am assuming here that these actuators are all single. Uh, so, so in other words, there's one actuator per damper. Uh, they're not all piggybacks, say they're not all uh, working on trying to open the same load because 20 actuators is quite a bit. Uh, the first thing that comes to mind is the control signal getting to the actuators. Um, for 20 actuators, you want to make sure that the controller output can handle that kind of load, like I mentioned to you, uh, mentioned on the webinar earlier, is the input impedances and the current requirements. Um, if it's an MFT or SR, you need a 0.1 milliamp per input of actuators. So if it's 20, it's about 2 milliamps total. So if your control output can handle a 2 milliamp output, it should work fine. Um, so that's the first thing you want to look out for. And it's also the length of the wire connections. Say those 20 actuators are throughout a building, um, depending on which actuators, maybe if they're all acting up, then I would check the controller. Now if only a few of them are not working and not they're working erratically, I want to check those lengths. Um, there's issues there is when if you have a longer run of wire, you may have a voltage drop. And the control signal you think you're giving is 8 volts, you're actually only getting 7 volts delivered to that actuator. So distance is very important. You want to make sure that the wire connections are not that long. And um, the other thing also is how they're connected. So let's say if you have a bunch of actuators, let's say these 20 actuators, and you're daisy-chaining them, maybe there's an issue within that link. Maybe one of those actuators is not working properly and the other actuators after that actuator is not responding to a control signal since that actuator is not moving. Uh, so that's another thing you want to double check. And the last thing that comes to mind is shown here is that negative leg of that control signal. You want to make sure it's tied to the common of our actuators. Again, it's used as a reference to ensure that it interprets the control signal properly. So if the control signal negative leg is not connected to the common, then that 5-volt signal does not look like a 5-volt signal to the actuator. It may look a little bit less, a little bit higher, so the actuators may respond erroneously. So those are the three things that first comes to mind. Uh, again, if that doesn't help, uh, I would recommend contacting tech support. Okay. Next question. When powering an on-off type actuator, is it a problem to have the common side of the transformer grounded? This would be for outside isolation valves where the transformer is located with the equipment. 
Um, since our actuators are Yule certified and they're double insulated, you'll notice that we don't have a common or ground wire. Uh, only our fire and smokes because it's more the code and the design of the actuator, but uh, there is no need for a common or ground wire for our actuators, so there is, Belima does not make any recommendations to ground or, con or send uh, earth ground to the negative leg of your power supply. So there are no issues there. Uh, our actuators are designed to work off of half wave rectification, um, so that's another thing that allows us to do DC and AC voltages. So an earth ground is not needed. Okay. Um, is there an estimated distance for voltage drop that you have experienced before the daisy chain actuators do not operate? Now, when it comes to daisy chain, um, obviously the closer the better. Uh, you don't want these actuators to be too far apart, but say if you're daisy chaining actuators, you've got a bank of five actuators on one end of the building and the other five on the other, on the other end, and you're using the feedback of that of that number five to feed into that number six, you want to double check, uh, first of all, the run. Obviously, if it's really long, uh, there is inherent uh, resistance within copper wiring. So the longer you make that wire, that resistance increases, to thus causing a voltage drop. Uh, so wire gauge would play a factor in there. So the larger wire gauge would be better. A thicker wire would help that to reduce that voltage drop. Um, when it comes to distances, a few hundred feet, you'll start seeing some issues. If it's less than 100 feet, you shouldn't. Uh, but again, wire gauge is very important. But if you're talking several hundred feet, let's say if it's across on the other side of the building, uh, one thing we do recommend is to use uh, our IRM100. It's an electronic accessory that we do have available on our catalog and on the website. It serves as a signal booster. I believe it puts out about 20 milliamps. It could be 40 milliamps, but I think it's a 20 milliamp output for 2 to 10. So say if you can take your controller input, uh, I'm sorry, your controller output, and feed that into the IRM100, and it gives that boost of current to allow you to drive multiple actuators with that single output. Now, if you're daisy chaining it and using that feedback of that fifth actuator, like I said in my 10 actuator example, you may want to use the IRM100 to drive that sixth actuator to make sure that you have no signal loss, or you better want to re, uh, rethink where, how, how you lay out and where you place the controller. Of course, if you don't have that option, then the IRM100 would probably be your best bet. Okay. For a two-section damper that requires two actuators, do you re recommend each actuator drive each section separately, or both actuators driving both sections, say with a common jack shaft? Now, depending on the application, that's where it comes down to, is if you need both dampers to be open or if it's good enough to have one of them open. Uh, like I, in that image I showed in the data center, let me go back here. In this case, uh, they're using free cooling from the outside air in case if they lose mechanical cooling, if there's a power outage, to keep all their computer equipment at a certain temperature. In this case, you want as many dampers as open as possible if that event were to occur. So in that case, in this application, you want all the dampers to be open. So in this case, you want all the dampers to be individually operated by its own actuator. Um, when it comes to, let's say, if it's just a typical um, air handling type device and you have a larger damper and you, want, you need those both those dampers to work together, you could use two actuators and link the dampers together and have those two actuators share the common load, or if you just want to uh, load consolidate and you have to jack shaft or connect those two dampers together, you can use a next size up actuator. Uh, for instance, instead of using two AFs, you can use a single EF if 270 inch pounds is enough torque, or maybe GK if you need the full 360 inch pounds. So you want to simplify the installation and also simplify your wiring as well. And so instead of having two actuators, you can just reduce the, the actuator count to one, and you only have one clamp and one set of wires to connect. So depending on your application, you could connect them both, but if you really, say in terms of fail-safe, one actuator, if one damper doesn't open and if the other one closes, or say if you need at least one of them open, I recommend having them operating uh, separately. Okay. 
Well, thank you so much, everyone, for attending today's webinar. As always, we appreciate you. Um, if you have any additional questions or comments, uh, please feel free to email us at marketing at us.belimo.com. Just to give you a heads up, the next webinar is scheduled for the 23rd of March at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, and it's going to be on the new FSAF-A product release and essential retrofit applications. Thank you, everyone, for attending, and I hope you have a wonderful day.